Would you join me in a word of prayer? Avinu Malkenu, our Father and our King, we love you and praise you and honor you, Lord. This is the day that you've made. We are rejoicing. We are glad in it. And I ask you, Lord, that as we get closer and closer to Shavuot, that we would see the power of your Spirit displayed in us, in our families, in our congregation, in every community, in every, Lord, in our country. We want to see revival. We want to see people come to know you. We want to see Israel leading in revival. Pour out your spirit there as well. Father, but let us be part of it. Let us not lose sight of your will for us. So, Lord, we ask now in the name of Yeshua that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, that they would be acceptable to you, Lord, for you are my rock and you are my redeemer. In the name of Yeshua, amen, amen. So last week we went from the Holocaust to independence and now we need to go to revival. Uh, we, have to, we have to have revival in our heart, revival in our spirit, revival in our being. We have to be revived on our way on this journey our journey is to Shavuot right now. And we want to see your power poured out on us, Lord. So we're going to talk about revival today and probably next week as well. So just to make sure we understand what the word means, the dictionary definition is revivalism is the movement that promotes periodic spiritual intensity in congregational life during which the unconverted come to Yeshua and the converted are shaken out of their spiritual lethargy. I pray you don't have lethargy this morning. Well, means that people come to the Lord and people get excited who are already believers. And that's what a revival looks like. Spurgeon mentioned it this way. The word revive wears its meaning on its forehead. It is from the Latin and may be interpreted thus. To live again. To receive again a life which was, has almost expired. To rekindle into a flame the vital spark which was nearly extinguished. Where are you on that, on that line between a spark that's nearly extinguished and a full flame fire? Certainly there can be either corporate or personal revivals. And we are praying through May 16th. We're fasting and praying through May 16th which is Shavuot, which is uh, Pentecost. And it's all about the revival. We see in Acts 2 an amazing revival. So we're going to go and look at the characteristics of revival, and I'm going to mention nine things, if you're taking notes, nine characteristics of revival that we're looking for. Number one. Believers are transformed from lethargy to excitement about God. There certainly was great excitement both by believers and non-believers in Acts 2. Whatever was going on, they made God number one in their lives. Their daily activities of making uh, a living or even just fellowshipping in Acts 2 took a back seat to focusing on the Lord. So that's number one. 
Number two, believers are continuously evangelizing, right? The book of Acts is all about sharing the good news. You know, Peter struggles at the time of Yeshua's resurrection and then receives this incredible spiritual and biblical insight all of a sudden. And in, in Acts 2, he preaches without fear and with Tremendous authority. And this is what we are to do. Number three, sinners are saved. Acts 2, 3,000 were saved. Now, there's an interesting thing about that because we see that not only is Shavuot the time of the giving of the Spirit, but it's also the time of the giving of the law. And if you look in Exodus 32, 28, at the Mount Sinai, 3,000 died in that verse. After Moses said to the people to choose what side they are on, do they want God or do they want an idol? So we are seeing that it, then 3,000 died, and now in Acts 2, 3,000 were saved. If you were... A believer in the 1970s was called the Jesus Movement. And literally hundreds and thousands of Jewish people came to know Yeshua as their Messiah. And many people who weren't Jewish, obviously, it just seemed like something was in the air. There, this, this was a, an amazing revival. And, and people were saved, and we didn't even know who the next person, who, who else was being saved. It, it just all came together supernaturally. Really, it was the beginning of the Messianic movement. Number four, sermons focus on sin and salvation and God's mighty power, not theology and not culture. Okay, Peter's message was all about salvation and prophecy of what God was about to do. He quotes, he starts out in Acts, in Acts 2.17, quoting from the Hebrew Scriptures, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my ruach, my spirit, on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So the book of Acts was about people coming to know the Lord. Very exciting because they were focused on messages of sin and salvation. Number five, believers were touched by music and sermons in a greater way and a more exciting way. It doesn't mean that the, the messages were necessarily better, but they transformed the lives of the listeners. So I believe this was a tremendous work of the Lord to anoint both the people who were speaking and the people who were listening, and, and there came a, a, a unity in that. Uh, the, and they understood that God was doing something amazing. And number six, that unity is key to a revival. People stop their squabbling and their, their trying to figure everything out and disagree and, and so on. But there's unity, unity in prayer before Shavuot in the upper room, unity in how to pick leaders. There was so much unity that they were having meals daily together and even sharing in their finances together because God's spirit just brought a trust and a unity. Number seven, spiritual gifts seem to appear in greater intensity and frequency. You know, there's an, uh, an uh, look, the gifts of the Holy Spirit were expected with each salvation. Each time you read about somebody coming to the Lord, it sounded like they were speaking in tongues in the book of Acts. And we see prophecy, 
we see just an amazing move of God's Spirit. And again, I believe that this was God pouring out His Spirit in, in unusual ways on the believers. Number eight, believers had a greater ability to overcome sin. Look, this has plagued us, you and I, as long as we're alive. Sin makes its, its uh, it, it tries to nab us, right? The enemy tries to take our Achilles heel and we have to overcome the sin that is so easily part of us. But revival is all about transformation. Revival is about repentance. Re we repent, which means we turn away from the world and the temptations of sin to a life dedicated to God and trusting in him for the victory. Part of of revival is transformation, our ability to overcome sin that is in our life. And finally, number nine, the last one, is our culture and our society is influenced by revival. With all the activity with the Lord, the culture had to be influenced. Our expectation is if our culture and our society will change because we see and we know that the light of Yeshua will overcome the darkness of this world. But I've got to tell you that this is an amazing thing. Is that we have seen the belief since 1970s, the believers have been quiet. And so they've allowed prayer to be taken out of schools. They've allowed uh, Bible reading to be taken out of schools. They've allowed for abortions. They've allowed for a change of the, the, what marriage is and, and, and sexual identity. So we have seen the opposite. We have seen secularism rise and change culture and society. It is now time for us to take back our culture and our society, and we must rise with, with a real understanding of what we are to do. Not only are we to be uh, spiritually strong from revival, but it has to lead us into actions as well. So, obviously, the question is, how do we get revived? I believe it's a supernatural work of God. I don't believe it's God alone necessarily, but it can be. God does not need us to revive us. In other words, he doesn't need our works. God can revive us all on his own. But generally, he works with us. And uh, we, we just ask for his grace and his timing but we need to do certain things, I believe. I mean, do you think that God would have us just sit around and wait for revival? Okay, we'll just kind of wait and see what happens. No, I don't think so. Um, I believe God wants us always to seek after him. We're on a journey, and we have to find out what his direction is and how to be obedient to his heart and to show our love and our worship of him, and revival is going to follow. We, <laughs> you know, everybody gets upset. Well, not everybody gets upset. Some people get upset with me when I talk about becoming a hypocrite for God. Um, you know, a hypocrite is when you feel one way and you act differently. The definition of a hypocrite is a person who puts on a false appearance a virtue or a person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated feelings. So stay with me here before you get upset. Let me explain. Take first Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Everybody knows these verses, shortest three verses in Scripture. Rejoice always, pray constantly, 
and in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Messiah Yeshua. So my question to you is, do you rejoice always? And does always mean always? Well, of course, always means always. And so the question is, are you listening to what God has asked you to do, which is to rejoice always? And the question is reasonable to ask, does this mean when I'm sad, depressed, angry, or irritated, I should still rejoice? Well, I don't know. Does it? God said to rejoice always. If I rejoice when I feel bad, am I a hypocrite? People could say I'm not being honest with my emotions. I feel one way, act another. Isn't that a hypocrite? A hypocrite's a pretender, a deceiver, right? But on the other hand, we are not hypocrites because we understand that a hypocrite preaches one thing and does another. Well, on second thought, so we are hypocrites because if we're preaching rejoice always and we don't rejoice always, then we're a hypocrite. Okay, we can go around and around on this. The point is this, that God wants us to act in a way that we don't necessarily feel. And I believe that as true as that is for rejoicing and giving thanks, it is also true for revival. If we give thanks to God in all situations, would we ever be angry with anybody, even if they did something really hurtful? Again, I believe in the same way we're to act as though we are revived. Now, I found this quote by Erasmus, and it says this, a nail is driven out by another nail. Habit is overcome by habit. And I think that is a very simple way of saying that if you make a habit of rejoicing, if you make a habit of giving thanks, and if you have, make a habit of being revived, then it overcomes the habit that you have replaced after a while. And so we are to behave in such a way even when we don't feel like it. If God wants us revived and we want to be revived, then develop attributes of revival. Make those attributes a habit, and we will be revived. I'm prayerful that he will reward you and I for our faithfulness to him with an anointing of his spirit. But one of the ways that we can do that is to speak God's word into our spirit. This, too, brings a revival spirit. And most of you know which scripture I'm going to go to. It's my go-to scripture, Isaiah 60, one. verses 1 through 4. It says this, The Ruach of Adonai Elohim is on me, because Adonai has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Adonai, that he may be glorified. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore former desolations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. To me, this is revival. <laughs> so picture it. What is revival? What, am I, what, is, what is my, my attributes? What, what should I be like? Number one, I'm going to be anointed to spread the good news. Number two, I'm going to see miracles as people are set free. Number three, I would be able to comfort those who are mourning. 
including consoling Jews who mourn, uh, giving them beauty, joy, and a spirit of praise. I would disciple number four people and others who would, would see that, uh, that I minister to people who are oaks of righteousness. That's the result of discipleship. Our people are oaks of righteousness. Number five, I would be glorifying God because everyone would know he did the planting. And number six, I would see the result of my works as cities that were desolate for a long time or dead, should we say, would be repaired by those I've worked with. In other words, they would come alive again. So not only are the people being revived, but the cities themselves are being revived. This, to me, is revival. This is what I'm praying for personally and corporately. What am I going to do in my efforts to see this happen? What are you going to do? Well, I'm the first thing I'm going to do is desire revival. I want to be saturated and consumed by this desire. I am going to trust God for this desire. I'm going to expect God to do this. I'm going to be persistent in my expectations. I'm going to practice habits that look like revival, even if I don't feel that way. So that's just the beginning of what I'm going to do. But as I read these, are you going to join me? Are you going to do them too? Number two, I am undergirding this with prayer and fasting. And so until May 16th, I am fasting and I am excited and I'm praying more. And so, you know, don't ask again what type of fast. Just do some sort of fast. Give something to the Lord that allows you to focus on him more and pray more. Three, I'm going to picture in my mind what I look like as a person going through revival and try to be that person. This is a daily fight. Now, you all know Second Chronicles 7.14, but are you familiar with where it comes from? In other words, what are the verses before that? In verse 11... It says, thus Solomon finished the house of Adonai in the king's palace. Indeed, all that Solomon had on his heart to accomplish in, this, in the house of Adonai and in his own palace, he successfully completed. Then Adonai appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. Let's stop there for a second. I have heard your prayer, Solomon. In other words, even while he was building these houses, the house for God and the house for himself, he was praying. And, it's, and God says, And I have chosen this place for myself, for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if... I send pestilence among my people. So God is saying, look, Solomon, if I do those things, I still want you to understand that you have recourse. And when I think of this verse, I also think of the plague of COVID. And I think of the recourse we have in prayer and in authority. And we can say to these plagues, to this virus, to be done in our lives and to the lives of our family. And so we now say Second Chronicles 7, 14, because now it is in context. When my people, over whom my name is called, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. It sounds like a prescription for revival, a prescription for healing. 
So I'm called by God's name. I humble my, myself by fasting. I'll pray more. I will seek God's face to get closer to him. I will seek to die to myself and not to sin. And, and uh, so, Lord, you have promised that you would hear my voice. Lord, you have promised you would forgive my sin. And Lord, you have promised to heal my land. And I pray in the name of Yeshua for that to be fulfilled. And I believe we have the authority in the name of Yeshua to do that. I believe that the Lord will heal our land through a revival. Send revival, Lord. We want God to heal the virus in our land. We want God to heal the sin in our land. We want God to transform the people of our land. We want God to bring unity in our land. We want God to make our politicians and media care about others more than themselves and their ideology and their ratings and all that other stuff. What is your hope that God will bring through revival? That's my hope. Family, salvation, reconciliation. Our homes need revival. Our churches and synagogues need revival. The nation and the world need revival. No military power can bring revival. No economic upturn can bring revival. No election can bring revival. Revival is a sovereign move of the Lord. When believers are revived they live a more consistent life. Their homes are more holy. Their homes are happier homes. And this leads the ungodly to envy believers and to inquire what they have that the ungodly or the, the non-believers are missing. Proof of me being revived is my desire and actions concerning sharing my faith. If sharing my faith is a daily act, activity, I will be certain that I'm going through revival. So we're going to continue to talk about revival next week. I think I've given you enough to think about and pray about. The only thing I would ask at this point is will you join me? in the expectation and the prayer and the belief for revival that this Shavuot would be off the charts spiritually, that we would see God do something that we could have only hoped for before and that he is actually doing it. God is calling us to raise our expectations. God is calling us also to raise the expectations of what we are going to do. I pray that as you count the Omer, as you get a vision for revival, you get a sense of revival. Join me as we close in prayer. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we love you, we praise you, and we just honor you. And we pray your scripture. You say in Psalm 85, send... Seven, will you not revive us again so your people may rejoice in you? And that's what I want to see, Lord. I want to see people rejoicing in you because there's a revival spirit all over. I, I pray that we'll sense this. We will we'll just know it's going on. You, nobody will have to tell other people. It will just be just such a strong spiritual move of your spirit, Father. And in Isaiah 57, 15, Lord, you say, For thus says the high and exalted one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place, yet also with a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite. And Lord, that's what I'm praying for, for my, myself, my family, that we will be humble and contrite before you, for our congregation, for our country, and that you will choose to revive us. Choose to revive us. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen.